In the late 1950s, a team of scientists from the U.S. Naval School of Aviation Medicine set out in search of unusual volunteers. Working in tandem with NASA, the Navy scientists were tasked with finding answers to a difficult and complex question. What are the prolonged effects of space travel on the human body? They could not afford to act rashly and endanger future American crews by sending them out to space. Still, they required a better understanding of what would happen to astronauts once they left the confines of Earth's atmosphere and the pull of Earth's gravity. Space conditions needed to be replicated, and ordinary test subjects would make it difficult to isolate for distinct factors of space travel that could affect the body. Of keen interest was the exploration of the sensory conflict theory. When what the human eye sees fails to match the physical experience sensed by the vestibular system, the inner ear structures that regulate the brain's spatial orientation, a common result of this phenomenon is extreme nausea. Commonly known as motion sickness, it's often experienced when the body is subjected to sustained and unnatural movement, such as when on a ship at sea or traveling in a car, and a common result is vomiting. NASA scientists had little idea how the brain and body would respond to the unusual motion of space travel or the prolonged weightlessness of being in orbit. Becoming space sick in the tight confines of a spacesuit or space capsule could be catastrophic, rather than just the mere inconvenience it would be back on planet Earth. With this in mind, the Naval School researchers, led by Dr. Ashton Grabeel, were on the hunt for something specific and unusual in their potential test subjects, some condition that would allow them to isolate many of the motion sensory factors that may contribute to space sickness. Their search led them to Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. There they would find exactly what they were looking for in a group of 11 able-bodied men who shared one significant trait. They were all completely deaf. Ideal Candidates The Gallaudet volunteers were not the first deaf test subjects to be involved in this type of space travel-related research. In 1958, students at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind in St. Augustine were brought to Pensacola to be observed in a similar fashion. It was one of these participants, Robert Greenman, who suggested to Dr. Grabiel that he might find more ideally suited candidates at Gallaudet University, a school which specifically caters to the deaf and hard of hearing. Greenman himself would eventually become one of the chosen Gallaudet volunteers. More than 100 people at Gallaudet signed up for consideration when the call was put out in 1961, including students, faculty, and staff. The screening process involved various motion tests, such as balancing on one leg and being spun around in a chair. The volunteers also had ice water poured directly into the ear canal. The Naval School researchers watched the subject's eyes closely during this last test, but as volunteer Donald Peterson remembers, their eyes would not move or blink, quote, even when the temperature of the water was 32 degrees. The researchers explained that this was a leftover test from World War II, when army recruiters would use it as a way to weed out draft dodgers who were falsely claiming to be deaf during their physicals. The key to the immense value of these test subjects was not only that the men were deaf, but how they became deaf. All but one of them had lost their hearing after suffering from spinal meningitis as children. The disease involves an infection of the fluid in the brainstem, which can have serious consequences. One of these is that the vestibular system in the inner ear, which governs movement and balance, is badly damaged. In addition to hearing loss, the disease also made the test subjects practically immune to motion sickness. This is what made them ideal candidates. They could be subjected to all manner of motion tests without issue, could be pushed to extremes that most humans could not withstand. By virtue of their childhood illness, the Gallaudet 11 became extremely valuable to the U.S. space program and their efforts to safely get an American to space. Astronaut John Glenn would later state that he was always envious of the Gallaudet volunteers' ability to withstand the brutal and disorienting tests that caused him so much trouble during his own training. The tests begin. One of the Gallaudet volunteers, David Meyer, remembers being chosen and making the trip from Washington, D.C. to the Naval School of Aviation Medicine in Pensacola, Florida. He was both nervous and excited, and recalls that several of the volunteers had signed up without a full understanding or grasp of the work ahead of them. They were eager to contribute to the cause of American space travel, blissfully ignorant of the challenges coming their way. The experiments in Pensacola would ultimately continue for the better part of the decade, and the means of testing became both increasingly creative and more elaborate. While the tests were relatively simple at first, for example, subjects had to walk across balance beams, later on, techniques used special equipment, slowly introduced, that would offer more extreme or unusual ways to push the subjects to their breaking points. These machines resembled carnival thrill rides and were designed to spin, tilt, swing, and whip the subjects around at dizzying speeds. When initial tests were finished, the researchers even added variables to try and complicate the results, such as having the candidates eat full meals or drink alcoholic beverages prior to testing. The Gallaudet volunteers remained cheery and unfazed throughout all of it. 
One particular piece of equipment used was the infamous Vomit Comet, an aircraft designed by NASA to make a particular aerial maneuver which creates a zero-gravity environment for those inside its cabin. NASA had been using these specialty aircraft since the late 1950s as a means of temporarily simulating the low gravity of space. The astronauts from the Project Mercury expedition trained on it in 1958, and were in fact the ones who gave it the stomach-turning nickname. But the fearsome flyer did not give the Gallaudet 11 any trouble at all. The scientists tested the subject's urine after flight, looking for the presence of stress hormones, which would ordinarily spike in subjects with normal hearing. The deaf subject's samples, however, came back clear. Pushing the limits. There were also many tests which could suitably be categorized as out of the box. The group took a trip to New York City, where the volunteers rode the express elevator of the Empire State Building up and down for hours on end. None of the 11 volunteers experienced a hint of motion sickness. For another test, Subjects were strapped to a flagpole with Velcro and observed for six hours. One of the most notorious tests was performed in 1964, when four of the 11 volunteers stepped into the Coriolis Acceleration Platform, a circular room 20 feet around which acted as a giant centrifuge, constantly spinning at 10 revolutions per minute. The room was equipped with amenities such as a kitchen, a bathroom, and furniture, so the subjects could live within it for days on end. The test lasted 12 days in total, and during that time the subject adapted to their constant motion, reteaching their bodies to move against the spinning force. They were put through various memory and dexterity tests, such as being asked to solve puzzles and throw darts at a target, all while the room continued spinning. Later that same year, the subjects traveled to Nova Scotia, where they boarded a wooden cargo ship near the Mykono. The ship carried them out to sea and into an area with known choppy waters and breakneck winds. The boat would rock and keel incessantly in the terrible weather. In the cabins, one of the subjects recalled being a little scared by the experience. Quote, but at the same time, we were young and adventurous. They stayed out at sea for a total of 14 hours. None of them became sick. One of the subjects recalled that the most difficult part was simply standing up for so long. All the while, the naval scientists diligently monitored and recorded all aspects of the participants' health and bodily functions, looking for stress points or causes for concern. The boat was only forced to return to the dock when several of the researchers themselves eventually gave in to seasickness. When taking electronic data was not possible for certain tests, the volunteers were asked to clearly and concisely document their experiences in writing. Different in a way they needed. By the time their long experiment was over, after nearly a decade's worth of observation, the naval researchers had gained invaluable insight into the body's complex sensory system. Thanks to the tireless and dedicated work of their unique volunteers, they were able to pass their own encouraging findings on to NASA and, in essence, give a green light to future American space travel. The deaf test astronauts were so committed to their cause that Robert Greenman even offered to undergo a risky, unnecessary, and experimental surgical procedure in the name of science. Greenman was the only test subject who had not suffered from viral meningitis as a child, and as such, he was the only test subject who had retained a small amount of his hearing. That difference led him to volunteer to have his still-functioning inner ear removed to see what would happen. Of the proposed procedure in 1961, Greenman wrote, quote, the results of that operation will be so valuable to research and a real contribution to knowledge, it would be very wrong of me to shirk what I feel is a real responsibility. The Navy, however, refused to approve the surgery as they could not predict the long-term consequences for the test subject. Something that was generally understood at the time to be a defect or a disability was, in fact, the most crucial asset to unlocking a variety of necessary scientific questions. One of the 11 Gallaudet volunteers, Harry Larson, looked back on the experience with the group proudly, stating that, quote, we were different in a way they needed. 